Welcome viewers. Our guest today is Mr. Revin Pruden, a community member and a martial arts expert. Welcome Revin. Thank you very much for having me. Again, thank you. So first of all, please tell us about yourself as a community member of our peace region. Sure, I'd love to. I'm uh, a member of uh, our local Rotary Club. In fact, next year I'll be our president, or in July, I'll be the president of the uh, Afternoon Rotary Club. I, uh, I'm a member of the local chamber uh, here in Fort St. John. I have three children, uh, two of them attending school here. One has just gone to uh, uh, Armstrong and will be returning to uh, graduate at North Peace. So um, yes, and my wife is, uh, is uh, very active in the community here as well. So we're settled right into the Fort St. John and the Peace community and, and love it here. Excellent. And what are the best things you like about Fort St. John? The people. The people are amazing up here. Um, we had lived here before, we'd moved away and, uh, and returned, um, mostly because of the friendships that we, uh, we've developed here in Fort St. John. And, uh, those are priceless. Wonderful. And what are your interests? Well, I have quite a few interests, but um, uh, my focus is uh, is mostly on my martial arts and uh, and the jujitsu uh, that I do, um, and of course my rotary. So those are my those are my two main focuses, and my family. Great. So please tell us a little more about the history of martial arts. You know, I honestly don't know the history of martial arts. I was I was looking. Uh, I was thinking about that question, and um, I have no idea, really. I mean, I hear what everyone else hears and, and those types of things, so uh, I think basic is just the science of combat. It's been around forever. And as far as I have read, you know, my little knowledge, which is sometimes a dangerous thing, <laughs> but it is almost like over a thousand years of history, and Jiu-Jitsu has been one way or the other. I know that the form changes but around five centuries and uh, coming, there are two perspectives as far as I understand. Some people say that it was developed by the samurais as they were evolving some techniques when they had relatively less weapons with them, but the purpose was there for defense. And some people say that it was uh, when there were armed samurais, so for other people who wanted to protect themselves, so they are the ones who developed it. But, but again, one has to go to thousand years of history or at least several centuries to find out. This is true. I, I have a third one for you. Good. That it was developed uh, uh, by a woman who developed uh, the jujitsu art of the okay. martial arts. Um, the other stories that I've heard is that um, karate was the original uh, martial art of the samurai, of the warrior, and uh, they went to uh, jujitsu uh, because of the invention of armor. So karate is about really hitting things hard, breaking things. And when uh, the soldiers started wearing armor, you couldn't hit them or break them. And they developed jujitsu. So you could have more joint manipulation and that sort of stuff. But like you say, who's to know? <laughs> Good points. And as you said again, uh, you know, the word also meaning the gentle art. Yes. So please tell us about that, perspe that perspective. That actually I think is really the, the most important thing about jujitsu, is that it is uh, um, an art of yielding and pliancy and um, the gentle way. And uh, in my instruction, I, I kind of work, um, I work that in to be very important uh, for the types of people that I, I hope to train or, or think would really require this. Um, in this day and age, where uh, uh, physical violence is really a taboo um, to the point where we've even taken uh, scolding children in schools uh, is very taboo. And now we have to wrestle with how we're going to manage aggressive behavior uh, from children or from adults, uh, and those things are very important. And this particular art, uh, because it's the gentle way, because it's a, a lot of joint manipulations, body manipulations, um, works really well when you have to deal with smaller children, with elderly adults, uh, with, with anyone. Um, it allows you to be able to control an aggressive uh, person or even a physical combatant, um, regardless of their size. And, and that's what makes it kind of 
um, a useful self-protection. And I like to use that word as opposed to self-defense. Um, and the subtle difference between the two is defending w would mean I would have to wait until I was actually attacked in order for me to do something or to protect myself, whereas self-protection is more of a preemptive um, look at uh, how you're going to protect yourself. So there's a lot of things you could do before it becomes physical um, or that I could become physical before you do if you were, if you were to threaten me. Right. We'll talk about uh, this aspect too and some general points first. There have been a number of things you have mentioned like karate mm -hmm. and judo and others. So in the last 100, 200 years, what have been the developments? They have, at times they have converged, at times they have diverged, gone to different countries. So just tell us whatever you feel like for the last around a century. You can mention Bruce Lee also wherever you like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can have a conversation about martial arts without, without having Bruce Lee come out, for sure. Um, and funny that you should mention him. In my opinion, I think the biggest change in martial arts uh, has been because of uh, Bruce Lee, or he at least pointed out what, what the changes are. When originally this art was developed, it was for soldiers uh, who were fighting in a very violent uh, um, lifestyle or, or very uh, violent times uh, in feudal Japan. We've uh, developed peace. Uh, a lot in the world. So there isn't uh, necessarily a need uh, to defend yourself in the ways that we had to a hundred years ago, and even more than a hundred years ago. So a um, hundred years ago in Canada, we were already becoming civilized. There was less of these types of dispute. There was more law and order in, in our civilization and, and uh, in our communities. So for me to to have to pick up a weapon and go to arms to protect my village or my city or my town wasn't necessary. And a lot of these arts started with that type of training and now yeah. it isn't necessary. So you have to kind of look at what the practical application is, uh, what the requirement is for what you're training for. And mostly now we've gone to entertainment. So sport is, uh, is kind of the, um, probably the more popular reason for taking a martial art, uh, some for exercise or, or just a hobby for these types of things. And there's very few occupations that really require a martial art, uh, policing, um, uh, well, law enforcement, military, or security uh, for those types of things. In a different conversation, I would argue that everyone needs it because uh, school teachers, I mean, they're already having a conversation about giving uh, uh, school teachers in the United States guns in order for them to uh, protect them and their students from the type of violence that's happening uh, in those communities. Canada, I don't think we have those same kinds of problems. And, uh, and our need for martial arts will probably be quite a bit different. So that's the big change in, in what martial arts have been in the last hundred years, is it's become more entertainment than it has been for practical need. Thank you. And do you agree that Bruce Lee, he actually died because of allergic reaction or there was some conspiracy theory? I couldn't even, I couldn't even guess to that one. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't know. But then you would have to include the death of his son um, while he was doing The Crow uh, to, to jump into the conspiracy theories of, of what Bruce Lee's life was. Right. And the other versions, they have gone to Brazil and the Canadian version. Please tell us a little more about the Canadian version. Sure, be happy to. Our, uh, the style that I'm, I'm currently uh, using is Kanrayu, which means Canadian uh, School of Jiu-Jitsu. And this was developed by uh, George Sevain uh, throughout his martial art career. And around the late 60s, he introduced it as Kanrayu. What he did was simply strip away a lot of the traditional stuff, much like Bruce Lee was doing with, uh, with uh, Wing Chun. Um, George did with, uh, with Jiu Jitsu. And he was a military police officer and training, um, he was a combatant training officer for the RCMP in Ottawa at the time, or in Ontario. And um, he just simplified 
a lot of the techniques that, that uh, were in the syllabus, and uh, he excluded a lot of um, techniques that would be complicated. He had a three-minute rule that he liked to teach by, and his philosophy was that if he couldn't teach a technique to a student in three minutes and for them to retain it, then it would be useless for them in a, in a defense or a protection application for them. So he simplified the Kanrayu syllabus to be very easy, very simple techniques uh, taught um, uh, effectively and, and just not complicated. Keep it simple, I think, was pretty much the, uh, the philosophy that he used through the Kanrayu. So our style is mostly developed for law enforcement and policing and, and that sort of defense. Uh, my teacher, uh, Kiyoshi Stephen Hisko, out of Chilliwack, who's also an RCMP officer, describes it as a throw, blow, throw uh, type of jujitsu. So um, it's a quick strike, a takedown, and a control. So it's meant for, again, law enforcement or simple protection. Brazilian jujitsu uh, really developed more into a sport jujitsu than a self-defense. And uh, the Gracie family, who kind of really brought that together, would probably argue and would, uh, I know this for a fact today, uh, are going back to their roots as being a self-defense art and less sport. So there's a lot of conversations in the jiu-jitsu world uh, about this division of the types of jiu-jitsu. And uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu has become, or BJJ as they call it, the more popular one because of sport. And, uh, and they've, again, kind of, I wouldn't say watered it down, but they've isolated it to ground fighting and grappling, which takes gravity out of, the, uh, out of the equation and makes it a lot safer to be able to use as a, as a sport. And the first attempt to, uh, to turn jiu-jitsu into more of a sport was judo, where they just simply isolated the throwing techniques uh, that we use in jiu-jitsu and turned it into uh, a sport and took it to the Olympics and, and that's where judo really came from. So it's just a small piece of the jujitsu pie. And I think everyone is just taking little slices of the whole jujitsu pie and kind of just concentrating on, on one element or uh, a few elements as to uh, what the entire art was. Good. And as you said, uh, the safer they are, of course, the better they are. And also, uh, the Canada's Criminal Code, Section 34. Please tell us a little more about it and its application. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but to summarize Section 34, that's the protection of self or defense of, of a person um, that's uh, detailed in the Criminal Code of Canada. And uh, Section 34 basically uh, is saying that you are allowed as a Canadian citizen to lawfully defend yourself against an unlawful uh, assault um, by reasonable force. Um, they don't use that language in the, in the code. What they mean is, uh, what they, the language they use is uh, a force not uh, excessive to, to the requirement of the protection need. And you have to be threatened in the first place. There has to be an actual real threat in order for you to defend yourself. And Section 34 simply uh, defines what, uh, what those parameters are. Right, thank you. And please tell us about your personal interest. When did you get involved in all this combat fighting and what have been your activities and your level of uh, the belts? Please tell us about that. Sure. When I started, I was an entertainer. I, would, uh, I was a singer in a band, a, a front man in a rock and roll band. And we played a lot of um, CD, I think. That would be a good word. <laughs> CD uh, bars, um, biker bars, and, and a lot of real rough locations. As the singer of a band, you, your job is to get a lot of attention uh, as a front man. And, uh, and unfortunately, the byproduct of that is, is you get a lot of attention, and some of it not always being positive. So I was uh, actually getting um, beaten up quite often for, for being 
the singer in a band. And um, I had taken some boxing um, when I was younger. And being 5'5", five, 5'5", five, five five, I'm a very small guy, and, and boxing doesn't really work when you're, when you're being beaten up by a multi, multiple opponents or, or people with longer arms. That sounds like a Rocky V situation. It was uh, definitely that. I had taken one uh, particularly bad beating, and uh, a fellow that really became a, a good friend of mine um, kind of mentioned, hey, maybe you should learn how to protect yourself. And uh, I thought, wow, that's a, that's a crazy good idea. <laughs> Let's do that. And he introduced me to jujitsu. And um, from the very first lesson, it all stopped. And, uh, and I was very excited about that. And um, he taught me just uh, how to stop getting beat up. He didn't really teach me how to, you know, it was the first lesson. He, he just taught me how to stop a few things from happening. And when that worked, I went right back and said, hey, that totally worked. Now what do you do? So it was just one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. And of course, being in, in that type of environment every weekend, and I was getting a, a plenty of opportunities to use it. And uh, the more I used it, the more I wanted to know more. And I just continued like that uh, for about six or seven years. Then I moved to Fort St. John. And I took a, a management position at the McKenzie Inn. And, and anyone from Fort St. John who is aware of the, uh, the drinking establishments at the McKenzie Inn back in the 90s um, may or may not recognize me. But I took on more of a security role then, or more of a bouncing uh, role, and uh, started to train my bouncing staff to, to work a little better for security, for takedowns, using jujitsu and instead of just um, uh, hockey fighting or, or uh, cowboy fighting. I don't really, I hope nobody takes offense to that, sorry. It became more of a, uh, less of a brawling and more of a, uh, uh, an actual security uh, type of um, environment. And uh, eight years here, that was, uh, that was a lot of practical applications and experience for me. When we moved to the island in 2004, I met uh, a fellow, Sensei Joe Fried, who was a uh, second degree black belt in German style jujitsu, which is also more of a military uh, based uh, jujitsu. And uh, I graded with him uh, to a black belt and uh, then moved over to the Can Ryu system under Stephen Hisco. And last July, I ranked to second dan, which is a second degree black belt in Can Ryu, right. and, and had opened my school as well, so. Excellent. And please tell us more about your school. It's a fitness club, so please tell us about the activities and how people are trained. Sure. Um, we're not so much a fitness. Uh, my company originally uh, engaged fitness was uh, more of a, of a fitness training, um, uh, personal training type of company where I put combative or combat training together with, uh, with a fitness routine. Um, what I've done with the Engage Kanrayu Jiu Jitsu is it is a Jiu Jitsu school. So all we train is Kanrayu Jiu Jitsu, um, ground fighting, stand up fighting, and uh, I have my kids' classes. So with them and my kids' syllabus is simply how to, uh, what we're really working on is less of the, of the fighting skills and more of proprioception. Uh, which is basically knowing where things are in relation to yourself. And uh, it really translates to dexterity and coordination and uh, learning how to learn these types of things, which is really important to self-protection. And when we use that word instead of self-defense, meaning uh, observation, uh, awareness, uh, to know what you should be looking for, uh, how to react when you're in a situation of, uh, of danger and what that is. So we teach a lot of the, the background stuff that is really, uh, some people would say boring, um, and then we try to blend it in with physical techniques, which is a little more exciting when you, when you can put those together. Good, thank you. 
And uh, considering the global information, unfortunately, the Me Too, you know, the issues which have been surfacing with Me Too campaign and assaults and worldwide, do you see a greater scope of this art so people can protect themselves at early stages? I think this will always be around because there will always be a need to protect yourself. I think with any martial art, it will peak in popularity and something else will, will come around. Jiu-Jitsu has been around for hundreds of years. No one really knew about it until Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or the MMA um, really started to make it popular. So even practitioners of, uh, of Brazilian or BJJ or sport jiu-jitsu have a, a small concept of what the bigger picture of what jiu-jitsu actually is. It, I think it's just gonna go up and go down, but from my opinion, I think jiu-jitsu is the premier uh, self-protection method. Thank you. And finally, how would you like to you know, welcome youth to learn it? Like what would be the advantages for children? if they learn at your club, so please, a message for them. Oh, most certainly. What you'll learn is focus and discipline. And what that simply means is, uh, is learning how to learn. You're going to learn to be able to uh, calm yourself, uh, to focus on what is important, and, uh, and to be able to uh, manage yourself. And that's what uh, the key uh, elements are for any martial art or for anything you're going to do. The best age to start at is, uh, I find, around age five, um, and then to any age, 105 uh, from that point. Anything younger than uh, five years old, it's really hard to work the amount of focus or the discipline um, to understand or to, uh, to stay, uh, just have the attention span. And, um, and we really don't want to uh, scare children under, under for it. It becomes a very um, uh, difficult, for my school, a difficult emotional transition um, to, to step into the, the focus and discipline that we, that we teach. So self-confidence is really a, an important byproduct of what it is that we do in our school um, by learning uh, to listen and to focus and to observe, uh, you start to develop a certain uh, inner confidence about yourself in what you can or can't do and to overcome a certain fear. We have a certain fear um, element in the dojo. We're very loud. Uh, I yell a lot. Uh, it keeps people alert and on guard. So you're in. Sure. I find for myself it keeps them from fooling around. And when they're fooling around with what we do, it's very uh, easy to have an injury. So um, I keep them on alert. And when they start to have that confidence in themselves and, uh, and get comfortable in the uncomfortable, this really wonderful thing starts to happen with, uh, with the kids and that self-confidence, their posture changes, their attitude changes. It's a little miracle, it's, it's quite wonderful to watch. And that really is the, uh, the payment for me, right? The, the, the what I get out of it, or, or what serves me as a person, is when you have those little uh, victories or those little wins when certain children um, make, that, make that transition from where they were to where they are. Um, a lot of the kids that come to me are being bullied in school. And, uh, and lack that self-confidence and, and have that awkwardness in social uh, 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 activity. And to watch that change is, is really, uh, it's beautiful, it's crazy. So um, yeah, that's cool. And in talking a little bit about, um, we were asking how, uh, how this would work or how jujitsu would be, um, the type of martial art for everyone in the future is, is just the simple survival skills uh, of minimizing the damage or minimizing the injury that you can face in any type of uh, an assault. When you watch TV or you watch the movies or even if you're watching videos on YouTube of actual assaults that are happening, um, you can sit back and you know 
what is going to happen. But in an actual event, it happens uh, a little more organically. And there's always that little uh, piece of your mind. It's almost like it's surreal or that it's, it's, not, it's not real. Where you're thinking, is this actually happening to me? We're all smart. We all think that we're uh, quite capable of, of looking after ourselves. Everyone has that sense of security about themselves. So if I ever got into a situation, I would be able to handle it. And as you're in that situation and things are rapidly unraveling, and you're trying to grasp the concept that is, is this really happening? Is, and to what degree is this really happening? How do I really should react to this? And as you're wrestling these things, of course, it, this is all transpiring. So sometimes even trained people don't know how to react or get caught behind the uh, momentum of the attack and are overwhelmed by it. And at that point, the skill really is to be able to duck and cover and to minimize the attack or to be able to de-escalate de these types of things. So this training really can be very complex or it can be very simple, but I think it's necessary for anybody and everybody because you just don't know. And if you're very lucky in life, you can get through your entire life without ever, ever having a physical confrontation with a stranger or with somebody you know. And when you get into the science of, of these types of things, you're more likely to get into a physical altercation with somebody you know than you are with a stranger. Great points. Thank you. And thank you also for coming to our program. And we wish you all the best. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Hi, Sean. Awesome. Good job.